If you're thinking about starting a business, you've probably heard all about the importance of niching down. I mean, how many times have you heard the saying, the riches are in the niches, or when you speak to everyone, you speak to no one? Probably one million times, right? But what if you don't know your niche? What are you supposed to do? Well, first, take a deep breath. You're in the right spot. Keep listening. I'm going to walk you through four clear steps to finding your niche so that you can confidently build a business that you feel totally aligned with and that genuinely serves a useful purpose in this world. If I'm being quite honest, I think finding your niche is often one of the hardest parts of entrepreneurship. Sometimes you have that inherent drive to start a business and you feel like you're meant to be an entrepreneur, but you don't know exactly what business you want to start. Who are you going to help? How are you going to help them? What problems specifically are you going to solve for people and via what methods? These are really big questions and it's totally normal to not be certain about any of them when you're just starting out. The goal is to find work that you love, that you're naturally good at, and that solves a problem for someone. That's the sweet spot. That is how you're going to wake up every day feeling joyful, peaceful, and excited to show up for your people. Because if you don't love it, you're not going to wake up feeling joyful and excited. If you're not naturally good at it, then you're likely will feel a sense of resistance instead of ease while you work. And if you're not actually solving someone's problems, then you're going to struggle to get customers. So you really need all three of these pieces, work that you love, work that you're naturally good at, and something that solves someone's problems. Before I share the four steps to finding your niche, I want to clarify exactly what I mean by niching down. When you first think about picking a niche, you're probably thinking about the topic you want to specialize in, right? But finding your niche even goes beyond that. It's not enough to just pick the subject. You also need to pinpoint the way that you're going to help people. This will help you figure out the specific type of business that you should start. So, for example, I help food and wellness professionals master SEO so that they can grow their audiences online and leverage that to build successful businesses. I do this primarily via my signature course, SEO Made Simple. However, that is just one way I could have built my business. If I really liked one-on-one -on -one work, I could have offered one-on-one -on -one business coaching, and that probably would have been very successful and lucrative. If I really liked in-person group work, I could have offered business retreats or conferences. If I enjoyed helping people implement, I could have started an SEO agency that does content creation and website management for people. But if I'm being honest, that type of work doesn't feel good to me on the inside. So I intentionally chose not to offer those types of services. I view myself as a content creator and a teacher. I'm not a coach, I'm not an event planner, and I'm not someone who enjoys managing a team. So I went a different route. I built a digital brand that primarily helps people through content and not my one-on-one -on -one time. I have a blog, I run a podcast, I have a YouTube channel, I have a thriving Facebook community, I offer paid courses, I send weekly emails to stay connected to my people, and I make almost all of my money through passive income streams that don't require trading my direct time for money. The answer to these questions are going to be different for every person, so you need to think about what feels good to you on the inside and roll with that. So next, I want to share with you the four essential steps to finding your niche. Four steps. Sounds easy, right? And on the surface, it is. But I want to remind you that finding your niche is a journey. There's no instant shortcut. You have to do the work and implement each of these steps. Then the clarity will come. So let's do a quick summary of the steps before diving deeper into each. Step number one, self-assess. Figure out what you enjoy and what you're good at. Step number two, brainstorm. Jot down subjects you're interested in and the ways that you like to help people. Step number three, network, because you really can't do it alone. Number four, take action. Get real life feedback on your ideas to figure out what might work. So let's dive into that first step, self-assess. First, I want you to spend some time assessing yourself. Ask yourself the following questions to get clarity on the types of things you enjoy and are naturally good at. Number one, how would you spend your day if you could do anything? If you had full control over what your dream workday looked like, what would you do? When would you wake up? What would you do first thing in the morning? Would you go anywhere or would you be working at home? What type of work would you do? Would you be alone? Would you be with other people? How and when would you like to end your day? Do you want to travel a lot? 
Do you want to have seasons to your work where you go really hard for a couple of months and then take a month off? Do you want to work a little bit every day? Or would you rather work longer hours just a few days a week and have the rest of the days off? Do you want to grow a team? Or would you rather be a solopreneur? How much money do you want to make in profit in your business each year? Remember, you are in charge, so you can actually decide this stuff and make it happen. Sometimes we don't make time to sit down and think about these things, and life just starts to pass us by. And if you don't have clarity on where you're trying to go, it's going to be really hard to get there. So it's important to take a moment and sit down and answer these questions so you have clarity on what you want your lifestyle and your career to look like. Then when opportunities come up, you can ask yourself, does this opportunity align with my business goals and life vision? That will give you clarity on whether or not to pursue certain ideas. Question number two, what kind of career might fit this lifestyle? Once you have a clear vision of your ideal workday, you can work backward to find the type of career that can provide the lifestyle for you. For example, let's say you imagine yourself waking up early, driving to an office that you own and decorated, meeting with clients from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., and then going home so you can have time for yourself and your family. Maybe you're a person who really thrives off interpersonal interaction, and this whole setup literally sounds like your dream. If that's you, perhaps an in-person private practice is something you should pursue. Or perhaps you envision waking up without an alarm and having the morning to focus on yourself or your family. You want to meet with clients virtually for three or four hours on your computer in the afternoon, and then you want to be free so you can pick your kids up from school or go on a daily walk outside. You enjoy some interpersonal interaction, but you don't want to do it all day, and you don't want your work to be tied to a physical location. If that's you, then a virtual private practice might be a good fit. Or perhaps you know that one-on-one -on -one appointments completely stress you out. You prefer quiet, introspective work like writing or photography. You imagine having a weekly set of tasks that you need to get done, like publishing two blog posts, setting up an email sequence, creating five social media posts, pitching yourself for podcast interviews, etc., but you're able to slot those activities into any day of the week based on your schedule. You envision making money by selling something online, like an online course or a membership site, or by monetizing your content directly through display ads, affiliate links, and maybe sponsorships. If that's you, then blogging, YouTubing, or podcasting might be your jam. Or even freelancing, creating content for another business and getting paid for it on your own time and your own schedule. Or maybe you just can't get enough of public speaking. In your dream life, you imagine traveling around the world, speaking at and organizing events, and the thought of being at home all the time literally bores you to death. Then maybe organizing conferences or retreats might be a really good fit for you. And on and on. There are an infinite number of scenarios that you might be able to dream up. So get honest with yourself. Don't get sucked into what other people are doing. Give yourself the space to really imagine and notice what feels good to you and go with that. Tune out the external influences as much as you can and listen to what your gut says. Question number three, what did you enjoy as a child? This is another thing that can help you get clarity on some of your unique strengths, and then you can play those up in whatever business avenue you decide to pursue. So ask yourself, what did you do in your free time as a kid when you were left to your own devices? For example, when I was a kid, my favorite things were to either read or play school with my stuffed animals. Yes, I would come home from school and then play school. And I even wrote a book for fun over summer break when I was in elementary school. The common thread is that I was obsessed with learning and then teaching. And that's basically what I do today. Constantly learning and experimenting with my online businesses and then passing that knowledge on to others through my online courses and content. And as another example, my sister was always outside being active. She was the sports person. She was always on the varsity sports teams, getting the gold medals. Today, she coaches swimming part-time while raising her young daughter. So think about the types of activities you were drawn to as a child, because those are great hints for the type of work that you really enjoy. Think about how you can bring those activities into your life today. Question number four, what do other people tell you that you're good at? What do you get compliments on? These things might just be off your radar because you're so close to them. For example, maybe people tell you you're really good at explaining complicated things, or you're a really good listener, or that you're extremely reliable. Pay attention to those things. Those are your unique advantages that you can lean into when designing your career. Question number five, what do people ask you for help with? When people say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for your help. I never would have been able to figure that out on my own. 
what are they talking about? What are people already seeing you as a go-to resource for? So for example, maybe you're really good at coming up with recipes for your family. Maybe you're really good at computer stuff. Maybe you're really good at writing. Maybe you're really good at editing. Maybe you're amazing at photography. Maybe you're great at design. How could you pull these skills into your current or future business? Oftentimes we overlook these obvious ways of helping and creating a business because we assume that if we understand something or are good at something, then everyone else must be good at it too. But most of the time, that is not the case. You can leverage your existing strengths to stand out and offer a valuable service that feels easy to you. Question number six, what makes you feel in the flow? Have you ever started an activity and then all of a sudden the whole day has gone by and you didn't even notice? When you can get into that space, that's when you know you really hit on something you're inherently good at. Ideally, you can build your career around this type of activity so that you can enjoy your work and be incredibly productive. For me, that's writing or creating of some kind. I can just be on my computer writing and hours go by and I'm like, whoa, what happened? Really, it's been three hours and I've been working on this? This is going to be different for everybody. Maybe for you, it's filming videos or cooking or nutrition counseling. But the key is that you're looking for activities where you're so in it that you lose track of time and you don't feel like you're working. And then on the flip side, question seven, what makes you feel totally drained? (laughs) Because those are the things that you probably want to start phasing out of your business and not include in your dream life. For example, I feel extremely drained when I have too many appointments with people and not enough alone time. Social settings drain my energy and I need time alone to recharge. But other people are the opposite. If you're an extrovert, social interaction recharges you and you're probably looking to include more of it in your life. So think about that when you're planning your dream. How does social interaction make you feel and what other types of activities light you up or drain you? And question number eight, what kind of work do you dread? Chances are there's probably some type of work that you know you absolutely do not like. For me, that's one-on-one appointments. I know if I have a one-on-one appointment coming up, that's literally all I can think about for days. Like on Monday, I'm already thinking about my appointment on Thursday, and it absolutely kills my productivity leading up to it. I can't sleep the night before. I'm thinking about every which way that appointment could go. And then afterwards, I'm going like way overboard with the follow-up. It's just like not a good use of my time or my skills or my strengths. So that might be you too, or maybe you're the complete opposite. It doesn't really matter. It just matters that you're aware and you know how this stuff affects you. Question number nine, what are you not inherently good at? So the flip side of what we talked about earlier, these would be things that, of course, maybe you could do, but that might take more energy or effort than it should. For me, that's design work, like hands down. It's not that I can't do graphic design. It's just it doesn't come naturally to me. Like I don't have that inherent design eye. I can recognize when something looks good, I just can't make it myself from scratch. So it just takes so much more mental energy. And then I'm just the type of person where at some point I'm like, okay, that's like pretty much good enough. I'm done when really it's not really that good and it doesn't look that great. So that would be an example of something that clearly I would be better off outsourcing than trying to spend my limited resources and time on because I'm not efficient at it and not really that great at it. And then another fun assignment is to survey your family and friends for your top three qualities. So actually go out and ask 25 people what they think your top three qualities are. You can ask on social media, you could send out a survey, like a Google form or something, but just straight up ask people that one question, like, what are my top three qualities? And I know it might sound weird, you're like, uh, what, I'm just gonna email people, like, hey, tell me all my best qualities, but if you're just transparent about why you're doing this, you can say like, hey, I'm taking this course or I listen to this podcast and I'm trying to help figure out what people think I'm good at so I can work that into my business. It's really not as awkward as it sounds, and a lot of times people are excited to tell you what they think you're really great at. Uh, I went back into my email because I did this in the past like a decade ago probably at this point, but I couldn't find the link. But from what I remember, I think the number one thing that people said I was good at was like book smarts, like academics, and then a few comments that I had good leadership skills. So I think eventually I worked those things into my business, but it did take me a really long time to figure out how to make those things fit. And one more thing you could try is to take a personality test. There's so many different options out there. You could do Myers-Briggs where they give you like the different letters 
like INTJ or ENFP, that type of stuff. Um, In case you're curious, I am an INTJ, so introverted, intuitive, thinker, and judge. And then once you take the test, it's pretty fast, like 10 or 15 minutes, you can Google your letters and then say career at the end. So like INTJ career or something like that. And there's tons of websites out there that give their opinions on this type of stuff. So if you Google INTJ career or whatever your personality type is, uh, they have some generally good insights. I think for mine, it ended up being that my personality type is known as the architect. And some of the things that they said would be a good fit for my personality, they said they easily take in complex principles and techniques and change them into clear and actual strategies, which Hello, I just talked about that. Like, that's one of my superpowers, like taking complex things and distilling them down into something that's easy to understand, which is what I do basically in my course and membership. So that was cool and pretty spot on. It says that architects can usually sort out the quote unquote noise of a situation and find the core thread that needs to be pulled to unravel messes. And in the process, they produce the most elegant solutions to problems. As they grow, their confidence, enthusiasm, and creativity typically lead them to more interesting work. And in time, they're likely to earn the independence they typically desire. Architects want to tackle intellectually interesting work with little outside interference, which is like totally me to a T. So, you know, sometimes if you feel like you don't have a good grasp on your personality or the type of work that might be a good fit for your personality, there are free tests out there that can help you. Um, There's also the, the Enneagram. That gives you a number of a personality that you align with. I think it's like one through nine or something like that. I am an Enneagram three, so I'm an achiever. And then in second place, uh, I was tied a perfectionist slash investigator. And it's hard to get a ton of detail from free reports. I think you have to pay like $19 or something um, to get the full analysis But it did say that my top personality strengths are perfection, ambition, and analysis. And they said the strengths of this personality type are great go-forward zeal for work success and goal accomplishment, knows how to work a crowd, supremely efficient, productive risk taker with novel ideas for solution, and good at adapting and improvising. But my cons are that I focus too heavily on personal image. So that goes into like learning how to accept criticism without taking it incredibly personally. Um, They're intolerant of failure from themselves or others. They repress their emotions to achieve maximum performance and results, etc. And then they give you a mantra that would be beneficial for you. So the mantra they suggested for me was, I am loved and I am worthy even when I fail, which I thought was pretty good. Like if I put that on my wall, I think that would probably help me. So uh, you can totally take any of these personality tests yourself if you're looking for some fun kind of playful insights into how your personality might play into your future niche. But before we move on, I do want to make sure that you actually write this stuff down so that it's all coming together on paper for you. I want you to actually go in and think about your dream day, your dream lifestyle, the stuff you loved as a kid, all the things that you think you're good at and what other people tell you you're good at, the things you're not good at or don't enjoy, and then maybe layer on a personality test if you want to. Physically write all this stuff down in a journal or on a note on your computer so you can look back at it later. Then we're ready, finally, to move on to step number two, and that is brainstorming. So now we have some frameworks to work with. We have an idea of the type of work that we might enjoy, but now we need to pin that or pair it together with the field that you're in. So for example, for me as a dietitian, how can I pin these ideas together with nutrition and dietetics? What are some possible niches and types of work that you might enjoy within that career? Uh, I just brain dumped a bunch of ideas off the top of my head. It's definitely not an exhaustive list, but here are some niches that tend to be popular in the nutrition and dietetic space. Things like health at every size, mindful and intuitive eating, pediatric nutrition, prenatal nutrition, fertility nutrition, division of responsibility feeding, adverse food reactions, nutrition and mental health, sports nutrition, nutrition for a medical condition of any kind, Um, like oncology nutrition, renal nutrition, diabetes, disordered eating, integrative and functional nutrition, cooking, health coaching, nutrigenomics, business coaching, 
RD test prep, internship prep, nutrition education, food service, meal planning, corporate wellness, school nutrition, sustainability, public health, food science, like that's not even everything. That's just literally what came to mind today. So once you have a topic in mind, next you need to figure out what are the ways that you're going to help people. And just to get your juices flowing, here are some ways that you can help people without being employed by someone else. You could blog, you can make videos, you could podcast, you could do one-on-one -on -one coaching or counseling, you could do group coaching or counseling, you can make a membership site online where people pay you every month or every year to access private information that's only available to paying members. You could create online courses where you walk someone through something and get them to a desired outcome, 100% online, self-paced usually. You could create an online certification program. So maybe you consider yourself to be an expert in a certain space and you wanna train and certify other people to become experts in that space. Uh, you could create and sell digital goods like eBooks or handouts or things like that. You could hold in-person seminars. You could do cooking classes. You could do webinars online. You could host conferences or events. You could write a book or a cookbook. You could consult for food companies. You could do a wide variety of freelancing, like freelance recipe development, freelance writing, freelance video production. And I'm sure there's even stuff I'm forgetting, but think of those things. Think about the niche, then think about the type of work that you might be interested in and write those ideas down too. Then step three, I want you to build a network. So find people who are doing exactly what you think you want to do. If you see people out there doing what you think you want to do, that's not a bad thing. I think I've mentioned this before, but it just means that your idea and your interest area is a viable business option. If someone out there is doing what you want to do and they're making money on it, you can do the same thing and make money at it too. So find those people. And rather than viewing them like competition, view them as mentors and like people that you can connect with and learn from. Try to connect with them, you know, not in a needy way. Don't come straight out of the gate asking for something. Connect with them as a valued peer. So don't just come to them for free advice or free mentorship because honestly, a lot of these people are probably very busy and as much as they'd like to help you, maybe that's not something they can realistically work into their schedule right now. But if you connect with them instead as a peer or you just connect with them to tell them how much you enjoy their work or add value to them, that's a way to get noticed and for people to remember your face and your name. And you know, who knows where that will lead you in the future. So I don't remember where I first heard this tip, but it stuck with me. I think it might have been on like maybe Pat Flynn's podcast or something like that, but I just always thought this was a great example. So let's pretend you're following someone in your niche, in your space, and and you admire them and you love what they're doing and you see maybe that they're traveling, like they're just, they're going to a conference or an event in an area near you or a city that you're familiar with. You could just shoot them an email or a, or a DM and be like, hey, I'm, I'm so excited to see that you're going to XYZ city. And don't ask them for anything, offer them value. You could be like, hey, I just thought you might really love this restaurant. I know you like Italian food. You have to go to this place, it's the absolute best. And then maybe send them a link and your favorite dish on the menu or something like that. Like keep it simple, don't ask for anything in return. Just be like, hey, I'm thinking of you, wanted to give you this nice little tip that will make your life better. And that could apply to anything. Like the restaurant's just an example, but just reaching out and being of value, you know, for someone without asking for anything in return. And then beyond that, just like friend these people on social media, follow them at least, join their email list or their Facebook groups, comment on their content, actively participate in discussions. Because, you know, for a long time, I was on the other side where I didn't have an audience, I didn't have a community or anything online to my name, and now that I'm on the other side of it, I do kind of have a community, and you know, people do reach out on a relatively consistent basis, either via email or social media or the DMs or my Facebook group, and you do remember the people who are engaged in discussions in your community. So even if you're in someone's group and you feel like you're just in there getting value out of it, kind of lurking on the sidelines, I promise you'll get even more value out of it if you engage and participate enough so that people start to recognize your name and your face. And then if and when you do get the opportunity to meet with or chat with the host of that group or the person in charge, they're going to be like, oh yeah, I totally recognize you from the group versus the person who's been in there for a year maybe but never commented so they don't even recognize your name. Just being active in someone's community can give you a kind of in 
if you do ever get the chance to connect with them further. So for example, back when I was doing more podcast interviews on my podcast, oftentimes the first place I went for ideas of who to invite on the podcast was people that I knew and had chatted with inside my Facebook group. So that's just one example right there of how it could pay off for you in the future. And you can also take time out of your day to just send someone a really nice message or an email, like how much you appreciate their work. You don't even know how far that goes for an entrepreneur. A lot of us are solopreneurs out here working really hard and it can get a little isolating and sometimes you're, you go weeks without hearing any kind words from anyone and you're like, is what I'm doing like making a difference? Does it help people? Is it, does it matter? And a kind message can really turn someone's day around and maybe you don't even know what they're going through. Maybe they're having a hard day and you could be the difference maker. So I know I need to get better at this too, but just setting time aside to send people a thank you or a compliment on something that they're working on. If you see them really genuinely putting themselves out there or doing a good job at something, sign up for some of their trainings or share their work. Just pressing share on social media or pinning their pin from their blog post or tweeting something or sharing the story on Instagram, all of those things can really help that person's business. And even the people who have tons of followers, the percentage of people who actually actively engage and share is a lot smaller. So to be honest, they probably will notice and remember you. So have that be you. <laughs> and the importance of doing these things is that concept of building relationships. And you're not trying to build a relationship with the intention of trying to get something out of it. You're trying to build relationships with your peers because that's how you grow. And then maybe when you in the future are trying to put together some sort of event, maybe a virtual event, or you're starting a podcast and you want to interview people, the more people you know and you're already friends with online or in person, the easier it's going to be for you to put something together that will benefit you and your peers. On the flip side as well, if one of your peers in the future ends up putting together an event or thinking of an opportunity, the people that they regularly keep in touch with are going to be the ones they think of first. So people won't think to refer to you or include you in something if you're not staying top of mind. So you need to be clear about what your strengths are and what you can offer to others, and that clarity will come with time. But the more you can stay in touch with the people in your network and keep them up to date with the changes in your business or the services that you provide, the more it's going to help you in the long run. Like seriously, opportunities just start coming out of the woodwork. So I wanted to share some of my favorite Facebook groups for connecting with other people. Of course, I'm going to plug my own Facebook group, the Unconventional RD community. We just surpassed 15,000 members, which is crazy. And that's a great place to connect with people doing works of all types in the nutrition field. Um, it's a place to discuss business. So if you ever have questions, that's the preferred place for me to connect with people. I really also love the Facebook group Food Bloggers Central for people who are food blogging. Uh, if you are a diehard food blogger, that is the best place you could go to connect with other food bloggers and get mentorship there. If you're into writing, check out the group RDs Who Write. That's a wonderful place to get help with freelance writing. And then whatever uh, area of nutrition or whatever field you're in, there's probably a specialty group for practitioners who specialize in that space. So just go on Facebook and search for communities centered around the topics that you want to specialize in and join those groups. And if you cannot find a Facebook group around a certain niche, that means you should start one. Seriously, start it today. Like that's how all of this stuff gets going. Someone's like, hey, this doesn't exist. The space I wanna be in doesn't exist. Let me make it. So if the community you're seeking does not exist yet, you should be the founder. Seriously, go out there, start that Facebook group that you can't find. And if you need tips on starting a Facebook group, I do have a couple episodes on the Unconventional RD podcast with more details on how I started and grew the Unconventional RD community. So you can search for those and take a listen if you'd like. And I want to close this out with some actionable items. So I want you to make a list of five people that you admire who are doing what you want to do. Where do they work? Do they work for themselves? Are they a freelancer? Are they employed by someone? What is their messaging? What do you admire about their website or their brand and why? Do they have a social media presence? Where are they doing really well and why do you think that is? What are they charging for their services and what types of services or products are they offering? Do they ever share how they got to where they are today? Can you find podcast interviews or blog posts on their own website where they share these things? Because you can learn a lot of information just by reading and listening. And then how can you connect with them? And I want you to lean on your network when you need it. Reach out to your network when you need help. 
Maybe you need business advice. Maybe you're promoting something and you could really use a few extra shares. Maybe, you know, you have someone who wants to work with you, but it's not quite the right fit and you can refer them to someone else in your network or vice versa. Those are great ways to lean on your network. Follow everyone that's in your space on social media, read blogs about their experiences, listen to their podcast interviews, and just become a respected peer. Then step four, take action. This is the most important step. Learn by doing. Jump in and try something. This is how you're going to learn. It's going to be scary, but you have to do it anyway. And for all you perfectionists out there, I'm speaking to you right now. Stop waiting. You are ready right now. Whether you feel ready or not, you're ready right now. And I just want to remind you, it's okay to try something and be bad at it. It's okay to try something that you thought you were going to love and actually hate it. It's okay to be all in and super passionate about something only to change your mind later. And what you try today is probably not what you're going to be doing forever. You're going to grow and change. Your business will grow and change, and that's normal. So do not let the fear or the feeling of permanence or uncertainty hold you back. Because guess what? If you hate your business name, you can change it. If you want to have a different website URL, you can change it. You want new brand colors or a new logo? You can change it. Hate the niche that you jumped into? You can change it. Nothing is permanent. So do not let analysis paralysis hold you back. The only thing that's not okay is doing nothing. That's how you're going to get nowhere. So time's going to go by either way like it always does. If you do nothing, you're going to just be sitting in the same place, no closer to finding the answers that you're looking for or building your dreams. And if you need a reminder on how messy this process could be, I want you to go find the Unconventional RD podcast on a podcast listening platform of your choice and go back and listen to the very first intro episode of my podcast. In that episode, I shared my entire journey, the good, the bad, the ugly, the whole thing, and I promise it will make this entrepreneurship thing feel a lot more real and relatable. So if this is you and you're just starting out and you're lacking clarity on your niche, I hope that you identify yourself in something I said to you today, because I have been in the same boat. When I started out, I had no idea what I was doing for a really long time, but eventually I did figure it out. (laughs) I have a thriving online business. I'm doing things that I love. There's really nothing on my plate right now that I don't enjoy, you know? And it it really didn't start that way. When I started out, 90% of the things on my plate I didn't truly enjoy. Then I just slowly traded things out, learned from all of those experiences, what I truly liked and didn't like, and honed what I was doing from there. So again, nothing is permanent. If you're still finding your niche and you're getting held back by these little things like figuring out your brand name or something like that, just freaking use your own name. That's the easiest thing. Just choose a general area of practice and give it a try. Like you don't have to have every little tiny thing pinned down because you're probably going to change some of it anyway. (laughs) And what do you really have to lose, really? And so while you're out there taking all this massive action, the thing that you really need to be doing at that time is paying attention to how all of this stuff makes your body and your mind feel. So when you're doing different types of work or seeing different types of clients, listen into your body and your mind and see how it's responding. What type of work or clients feels fun and light? What are you looking forward to in your day? What could you start doing and all of a sudden hours have gone by? In contrast, what types of activities give you a pit in your stomach? What frustrates you? What feels out of alignment with your beliefs or your personality? What topics get you excited to talk about on and on and on? Or what makes you hesitant to talk about because you're not really passionate about it? Or maybe you're even embarrassed that you're doing that thing. What clients or customers have you worked with that you just seem like time and time again you get the best results? I guarantee you'll end up finding patterns that emerge if you work with enough people. But really, it's all about doing. Because without doing, you're just guessing on all of this stuff and you're never going to get closer to actually figuring it out. And for those of you who might be listening or watching and you're like, I have a nine to five. When am I supposed to be doing all this stuff and taking all this action? Guess what? You have a harder road, but you can still work in the margins. And honestly, in some ways, it can even be preferable to start your business when you still have a nine to five or at least a side gig to keep you afloat. Because if you're still unclear in your niche, which most of us are when we're starting out, it is harder to get traction. 
Because until you know your niche and the problems you solve and who you're serving, your marketing is going to be a little subpar. So it can be good to have income to support yourself and take the pressure off while you figure it out. And there's really nothing worse than trying to sell from a place of desperation. People can smell that from a mile away and that's going to add to your frustration. So you know you don't wanna add being completely broke on top of the desire to find your niche. That's not a good combo. So in this case, you can work in the margins of your life. You've got the mornings, you've got lunch breaks, you've got evenings, you've got weekends, and any space that you can carve out. It's those small steps, those little micro actions that you're going to take each day that will lead to the huge results over time. So it's not going to be like, oh, I need a two-week period where I can clear everything off my schedule and get all my ducks in a row. No, it's the one hour every Wednesday that you're coming in, showing up in your business and taking action. So as best as you can, break down your bigger projects and goals into small steps, like 15-minute tasks. Get it down to little things that are that small and actionable, and then pencil those into the time that you do have. No matter what your situation is, where you're at in life or your business, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to make this happen, you can. So recap of the action steps from this video today. I want you to make a list of three niches that you might be interested in and then start researching them. What is required to become an expert in this area? What's the time and financial cost? Who are the mentors available in that space, the support and training available, etc.? And then what small step can you do today to get started? Then once you're ready and you've chosen the one you're most interested in, just jump in. Seriously. And of course, if you decide that you're interested in blogging as part of your career path, I would love to help in whatever way I can. Probably the best place to connect with me is inside the Unconventional RD Facebook community. It's free. Um, just search for it on Facebook or find the link below this video. And then I also have a membership called Expand where I go beyond just blogging and I teach you how to grow your email list, repurpose your content into new formats, and create automated sales funnels to sell things for you passively. So yeah, that's where I'm at. That's how I can help you. I hope that this whole episode gave you some hope and some clarity for those of you who are feeling a little bit lost or uncertain about your niche. I think the overarching thing I want you to take away from today is A, that it's perfectly normal and okay to feel that way, and B, the only way you're going to get out of feeling lost is by taking action. Of course, I don't want you to take willy-nilly non-strategic action. That's why we do the self-assessment. That's why we brainstorm. That's why we look for mentors. But once you've gotten a little bit of clarity on what's out there, you've just got to jump in. Whatever you jump into, that doesn't need to be your forever thing. I jumped into like five different pools and I'm not in any of them anymore. You know what I mean? Like you will eventually find your way. And each misstep or thing that you try that doesn't quite pan out the way that you hoped it would, you are still going to learn something from that. If anything, you learned what you don't want. And you know, compared to starting out and having no idea, knowing what you don't want, that's something you can cross off the list. And that gives you more clarity, even though it might not be the clarity that you hoped. <laughs> So again, if you want more connection, come hang out with me inside my free Facebook community, the Unconventionality community on Facebook. And that's all that I have for this week. Be sure to subscribe to this channel if you want to get all the new content that I put out, and I will catch you in the next video.